Hey everybody, welcome to Northern Washington, the Sand Poyle River Valley, the Sand Poyle Arm, made famous by geologist Brian Atwater, who's in the other canoe there in the yellow hat. That's Joel Gombiner, that's Karen. And who's paddling my canoe? Yes, sir. <laughs> Jerome Lessman. Jerome, thank you for crossing the border and joining us. They keep letting me in, so I'll keep coming. <laughs> we just spent an hour at the outcrop uh, over your shoulder there. Um, a series of beautiful lake beds from Glacial Lake Columbia time. You're a busy guy, Jerome, with school, but you managed to break away for a few days for a long weekend. Uh, what were you hoping to get with this experience with Brian Atwater and, and your co-author, Joel? Uh, well, a bunch of things. One is the sand Poil arm is a really central part of the Missoula flood story in yes. terms of timing, in terms of frequency of floods, in terms of how we interpret some of the deposits. So it's a really, really critical, something I hadn't fully appreciated so not that long ago. There's, it's a real sort of linchpin location for a bunch of different questions around the flood timing and the, the events. So there's that. And uh, I've never met Brian Atwater, so this was a good chance to meet him. He's done some work that's probably some of the most detailed uh, in all of the scab lands. Yes. And it's at a totally different scale than some of the other really detailed works that Brett's. Brett's just took the you know, the ginormous view of the system mm -hmm. and try to make sense of it. And then mm -hmm. Atwater's work is super detailed and meticulous on, you know, centimeter thick or less beds of silt clays and other times much thicker. So it was a whole really interesting story. I don't know how you preserve something that thin um, as, a, as, a, as a single, <laughs> but it's, it's really wonderful. Ah, you have good down valley down valley current indicators high in the flood beds here and and uh and joel is is brushing out some of those four sets so, when, so sorry brian i gotta yeah. sort of catch up to when you say a flood bed yeah you're you're talking about the entire rhythmic package as a flood bed or are you talking individual beds as floods no the whole package here from the top from the top of the the pink flag down below a level we can't see is a flood bed yeah it's a single flood bed yeah it's so a it's single within a flood yeah there's lots of there's for and it's not necessarily pulses in the flood water there are there are ways of of packing sediment uh, against hills against late sloping lake floors here and then during waning phases of the floods have these come down as turbidites and and we get cross valley current indicators out of those From that. yeah okay okay let's 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 try to get up higher the main the main point of this <laughs> That's a bright and shiny object, Jerome. Come on, little crow. <laughs> it's cool. It's a real puzzle, but the basic, but the real, the, the real news in this place is what direction was the water flowing to in place initially to bring, to in place the big thick beds. <clears throat> all right, all right. <laughs> Okay, everybody can get up here. Yep. Did you bring everybody here for the GSA trip, Brian? Oh, not at all. No? No, we went, we went to a riverbank exposure that was nasty, and Joel and I looked at it yesterday and decided it was even nastier. Okay. But we really wanted to bring Jerome to it because it has, it has um, within the barbed intervals, it has sand beds that are half or three quarter meters thick I see, thank and they're you. probably from the okanagan lobe this tongue of it being at its maximum and close by Going down here, down yeah the valley. yeah yeah and and you can correlate that barbed interval down valley and you can see it become an ordinary looking barbed interval that's only thick, but up there that's your proximal it's me it's proximal, proximal yeah. yeah but it gives you an idea what that should look like yeah, and what the 
what the sampoil contribution is. Uh, let's see, we got to get you folks up here, and we didn't do a good job of that. Uh, so, Karen, let's go this way. I want to. I want to make sure you get to see this because it's really pretty. Oh, you know, pretty. Yeah, I got. I got your flame. Here, step back a little bit if you dare. Okay, so let's get Karen here for sure. Okay. Okay. So this this silt and clay, it's hard to hard to count them here, but these are almost certainly varved, okay? Right. There's typical lake bottom things. And the question we're asking here is what direction did the water flow right. to begin to emplace a bed that goes from coarsely speaking, from here to the pink flag. Okay. okay, and so what was brown down there in dry form looks like that, and you can see the contact is crystal clear over there, the difference yeah. between the varves above Definitely. and that thick thing, okay? Yeah. And then you go down here, and it's, it's mostly covered because this is recessive. Mm -hmm. And this is a particularly complicated one because this, somehow this, Varved interval got loaded by what? By water? By only this much sediment? It's strange. Okay, this is a, another bright and shiny object. But the um, here, here you could imagine that you had you had a a ripple form with the gentle, gently sloping upstream face, and then the slip face on the far side where the grains fall down right? right and they build things people call forsets right. and you can see yeah. forset bedding like this so this is evidence for down valley directed flow but it's not at the very base instead of towards the base what you see is evidence for up valley directed yep so that's we'll see variations on this theme with the other two up up above us <clears throat> and uh so Jerome is, Jerome is very good going for the third dimension here because you, you get an apparent dip with these things. And what you really need to do to nail the paleo current direction is you have to dig parallel to the ripple crest. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. And then you see, and you see no preferred orientation, sometimes one way, sometimes another in that case. And then as you swing around to the direction of the flow, it's going to be entirely in the and Joel and I uh, didn't do that enough yesterday. And for for me, Jerome, I, in this, uh, I some of these are probably wavy enough. I, I recall digging back like a, a half meter or a meter or more to get a real, yeah. to, to search for a perpendicular. And yesterday we didn't try to do that. There's hints of, there's like there's little reactivation surfaces on some of them, but but not many. And so it's just a little... Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that one. But this one is clearly going this way. Yeah. The lower one. Yeah. The upper, some of the upper as well. The upper, the uppers. But some of the uppers going down valley. Yeah. Apparent. I think they're. Per these, these are. Those are, those are down valley. Do you well, see any up, do you see any down, up valley? I'll just. Yeah, go ahead. I have to see what that side looks like. So, well, yeah, that's kind of like a yeah. You something even in that face, it's, it's still going that. into the outcrop. Yeah. So we're under the here we go. Here we go. Lake Columbia. Yeah. But we're trying to decide where there's perturbations and from which direction perturbations <laughs> oh come on nick come up with plain english that that's dramatic you call you call you call this a perturbation i would as well this poor lake 
That's pretty good. I'm trying to decide where the energy is coming from in this calm lake. Right? Uh, yeah. All right. So. Is that the context? So that. Yeah, more or less. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, is it calm? That's not calm. That that's not calm. Yeah, but this this is this is this the amp. Is... That's the ambient lake. Yeah. Is that stuff okay? That's the yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. and then and then it's and then it, and then it's perturbed <laughs> by this, right? It really gets well. I don't think there's any anger involved in the, for the lake. So here we here we get back into this, but you know, okay. Yeah. So how is that detached, right? And and this is the evident. This is the evident source for that, and yet it somehow gets splayed out. Yeah, I see what you're saying. <laughs> it's bizarre. Like a sandboard, like... but look, let's let's um, let's let's move up slope and look at another. We can always pick this up on the way back. Let's look at all three. See the big picture first, yep. and then come yep, back yep. down. For sure. <clears throat> so we're gonna head up, um, Karen. The best way will yeah. be straight up oh, here. Easy. So use your ice axe. Make a step or two. Easy. I would go with the I'd go with the tip on it for that yeah there you go ah you gotta get a f oh, so dig a place still. yeah dig a place for a foot and go for it be perturbed when you <laughs> dig when you dig it, it will help brian in the mid 80s you were working these beds and you assumed it was a missoula story no 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 the missoula study story was very much controversial okay yeah yeah, your 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 okay. question is is well informed. So um, yeah, at that time, because in the flood rhythmites in southern Washington, mm -hmm. appealing to um, to animal burrows and lus and and the doublet of or triplet of volcanic ash layers was was not fully accepted. People wanted. Mm -hmm to see whether there was evidence for passage of time between successive floods. And so here you can actually count the decades that elapsed between successive floods. And it, it made a big difference that, that, these, um, that these were back floods and, and not, not coming out from the ice sheet. So this, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> it would just it would be like ripping up the underlying varved interval yeah exactly yeah, yeah 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 and there are also there there are so many instances of sand that doesn't belong in the section coarse sand layers that are in here huh. that are that are probably injected um because the outcrop shows signs of 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 the sequence just being dismembered as the other uh, with the um um, with the uh, perturbation that was occurring down there. <laughs> so, <laughs> in in the Okanagan, yeah, on my side of the border, yeah. in Lake Penticton, there's some big lakes deposits. Okay, uh, in the '70s, John Shaw had talked about these winter sand layers, okay. which are exactly that. They're they're basically anomalously coarse sand beds f within clay units, within clays. Okay. And he and he had interpreted those as sort of um, local inputs of sand from wherever the sediment's coming from in, in this sort of arm, and it's really just sort of readjustments of the the okay. poor water pressure in the you know if you have fans or deltas that and you have basically little failures right little just little okay um, without being necessarily well it, great it, big floods into the it can't be ruled out here, but what you can do with these is you can correlate. I can't correlate with this outcrop, but yeah. there are some marker, I, or at least I haven't tried yet. I think there, there probably are some marker beds in the varved intervals that will yeah. allow you to match. Mm -hmm. But then you can, you can ask whether coarse sand seen in a sequence down there is present also right. up here. Right. And it's, it's usually the opposite, that the, that, the, that the big sandy beds are up north mm -hmm. in the varved sequences okay. but the, it, it's only where the vars are just getting torn apart that yeah. you get this these these oddball sands 
Let's go up one more because but, Joel's got even an even better one up but there. But they're only oddball sands. Hmm? You differentiate the oddball sands from other sands on the basis of having ripped, torn up clay in them, correct? Um, or are there mineralogical differences that you can I consider? mapped them, put it that way. Okay. You know, I asked what along what val stretch of the valley, can I see them right. for tens of kilometers along the valley? Are yeah. they... And and there are certain things I could, certain layers I could correlate, and ones that I didn't think I could. Gotcha. Hmm. Okay. 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 Yeah. Let's go to the high one. This is the high one. Karen will give you the whole ripple form more nicely than this one does. He's just taunting you to get up here. Like there's better things up ahead. A lot of cleaning. It was, it was pure discovery for us. I'd seen this place in reconnaissance and seen one, one, one bed with North Valley, oh, wow. North directed currents in, in 82. And then I found a better section across the lake and I, I logged and I didn't have to take a boat or anything to get to this one. But Joel's, Joel got climbing ripples at the yeah. top of this. And that's something we haven't seen over the, in these lower ones is, is a, is a, is the north directed flow going through that you you can explain it better Jerome what that transition where you've what you slowed the water down and you've increased the sediment load or some yeah. some trade off there so that you're depositing on both the sauce and the lee side of the of the ripple so the, the bottom part yeah so this is part of a basically a turbidity current which means it's like a mixture of water and sediment and it's moving in the lake basin so it's, it's kind of rushing up the valley it's not necessarily a turbidity current but go ahead turbidity uh, current sediment moves the water right to, to a point parts of it but it depends i mean if we're on the upper parts this would be like buma c d and e oh, i agree they look like a buma sequence but conceptually they may be different if the if the because the impetus is here is probably drainage of Lake Missoula, which is this big volume of water. Whereas the turbidity current, it's it's the it's a sediment, it's a sediment gravity flow. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and maybe it has transformed into that. But anyways, go ahead. Your your explanation. Okay, we'll we'll come back to that. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I the mean, two I'm things work. <laughs> I'm confused about that. I don't know what to what to how how to go with that. But go okay. ahead. Before we put a name on it, yeah, let's yeah. just explain what's yeah, probably yeah. happening. Yeah, yeah. Let's, and then we we'll. we'll so this, this is moving up the valley to right. some degree. And we, we infer that from the direction of the cross stratification that we can see the laminations. It's moving up the yeah. valley, not to some degree. Hey? <laughs> not to some, it yeah. is moving. It's yeah. moving up the, the valley. valley. Definitely. <laughs> but initially, when it's fast, it's slowing. Basically, what you should think of is this is slowing down right. overall, losing energy. Right. And so initially, it's more energetic. And the grains are basically moving along. Think of it as being moved along the bed. And so we don't preserve much on the climbing side, but we preserve right. on the, and gradu and there's a whole bunch of sediment suspended, right? Right. It's kind of like a big sort of turbulent plume of m murky water. Right. And then as this is losing energy, huh. then that trend is decre decreasing and the suspension deposition is increasing. And so initially you're kind of eroding the, the leading edge of it, the yeah. stoss side, depending on the lee side, right. and gradually you preserve because you, you tend to, you're not basically scraping it off every time. And then you build it on the stoss yeah. and on the lee, and then ultimately sometimes you just see oh, being wavy because yeah, okay. it's coming out of suspension and just kind of draping the form. And so you get this transition just because it's decelerating sure. and you're shifting from more traction transport to suspension deposition. Got it. So if not a turbidity current, what 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 else? I mean, it's not sort of the the tail end of a turbidity current, or. I don't know, but just it's. I thought that to, that the idea of a turbidity current was 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 related to sediment. Related to what makes who's moving what. Yeah. And and with a turbidity current, it, because it, it hugs the bottom. Yeah. The water is not initiating that movement. Right. The sediment is making it move. Here, you have this big water, this, this big flood comes into this lake. Even though this lake, the lake level, do we have a shoreline we can see up there? I can't quite make one out. But, you know, we're probably still in 100 meters of, of water ambient. And so is it, what's, 
you, st you can get those, those forms out of regular stream flow, right? Of course. Yeah. Where, so, so did Lake Missoula just simply entrain Lake Columbia and make it into a river? That's a sort of a different concept than, than calling it a turbidity current. Yeah, except that it has a big implication in terms of if you make the argument that Lake Columbia and uh, Lake Missoula entrains Columbia into a river like form, uh, Lake Bottom is river bottom. Yeah. And so yeah. the shorelines become essentially inconsequential. Yeah. The Otherwise, shore. the whole thing is subaqueous, right? That's, what, that's the difference, right? One is subaerial or close to subaerial. And the other argument, if it's, this is sort of a bottom-hugging current of dense sediment, yeah. then it's all subaqueous. I guess so. If you were to do, if you were to, if you were to measure, measure velocity through the through a water profile, yeah. a water column in Lake Columbia as yeah. a Missoula flood comes through and deepens the water, maybe yeah. by doubles the depth of the lake. Yeah. You know, I mean, so I, 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 do you do you end up in tr do you end up moving that entire water column? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I see what you're saying. Like it's a surge of water, right? Yeah. It's probably more like a, a yeah. think of it as a wave. Yeah. Rather than right. I see what you're saying. I see that. Yeah. But here we may be somewhat removed from the highest energy portions of that wave or that surge. Well, we are exactly. So we're able to because this would not survive. Right. The, being in the axis of that wave coming through. That's exactly it. And so it's for that reason that the nor the evidence for up valley directed yep. flow yep. is preserved up here yep. in this passive place where where the whole s stack is preserved yep. pretty much. And then as we go down valley, it just get, becomes a big sty. Yeah. And so can you tell anything about velocity from that? Oh, yes, you can. Yeah. Somewhat. Doesn't have to be particularly fast. Right, right, right. Uh, a few centimeters per second, yeah. probably something really? like that. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have to be terribly fast. Uh, yeah. Maybe a bit more, but yeah. Uh. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so a person tuned into to big um, flood effects out in the channel scab land would look at this and say, oh, "This is just, you know, some small potatoes." <laughs> but you you have to make allowance for two things first where we are in the landscape in terms of how the waters get here. Second, where, where, how deep the water was to begin with. And then finally, you have to, you, you have to go down valley and see what the effects are in the main, in the main course. And then you, then you get a better sense. But the issue too is that if you're in the big potatoes, it's erosive. Right. So right. <laughs> there's nothing left, nothing right? There's left. nothing yeah, left. Yeah, there's very little left. Oh, that's, yeah. See, those, those you can see. But, yeah, so then what, what do you do with, what do you do with this part here? <laughs> Which part? The, this little interbed within that. And then the light that's inside of the, the dark, the dark. There, 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 I, 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 they're a little, I found them really hard to count. Because here you have a little stringer of if, light in dark. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that would be one two, three, four. four. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, if you count them that way, do you, you wanna, do you go light, dark, light, dark? Or do you want to make a minimum light thickness? Or? I'd, I'd, I'd want to see it. Thick. I'd want to see it in a drier face. So, so drier. Me, the, the, yeah. The, drier, bringing, drier face brings out, brings like, out stuff. Show them these, Nick. They're just, they're, they're, thank you. They're, they're uh, yeah. You want to be, you want to just be careful in concluding that each of those is annual. Well, is it year? Right? Yeah. Is it controversial to say this is annual? For sure. Is anybody saying there's no way we can confirm hey. this is annual? If you want to, something for scale. Thank you. <laughs> so get around to the face in the shade so you can hear. Just come stand yeah. here. Yeah. Well, just get out of your way. You can yeah. come around. If you go down. Right? I be careful there. That's yeah. But you can have varves in more than clay. You can have varves in silt. You can have varves in sand, even. Uh, oh. Difficult to make the case. You need to some other way of establishing time for those. Otherwise, you have rhythmites. 
Varves are rhythmites, but not all rhythmites are going to be varves. So rhythmites, <laughs> rhythmites are patterning, like a repetition yeah, yeah, yeah. of the same pattern. So, so varv, varv is a dangerous term because yeah. okay. it's 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 interpretive. Yeah, you're 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 asserting that each of them is annual. Got it. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so the way to qualify that is to give a range in your counts that that tries to cover your uncertainty as to what constitutes a full year. And that, that doesn't always, in my example here of, of overestimating up valley relative to what I saw down valley, that, that the, even that precaution doesn't save you. So you could have a year with a lot of storms yeah. or a year that's really cold and yeah. doesn't melt in the summer. Yeah, or for whatever reason you get a, a, a discharge of a, of uh, from a, a a lake that's that's dammed off the side of the ice tongue and <clears throat> even even water coming from Canada, no is possible. <laughs> <laughs> Not that. Here's the molecule. Try to get that AGI to paddle the canoe, and then we'll talk. Nick. <laughs> <laughs> from uh, uh, a, a catastrophic outburst, no, a no, catastrophic not. failure of the Okanagan Lobe as a dam for Lake Columbia. Columbia. Yeah. And and at the previous place and here, yeah. where's the water? <laughs> there's not very much Lake Columbia left. The point, the point is. No, there's like 10 meters of water or something <laughs> or not even. Right. You know, there, there are going to be places on the path, on the flood path out to Grand Coulee where, where there, there probably was still some water in the, in the lake, but it's not like there's for those down Columbia floods, but it's always been thought that uh, it's almost as a article of, well, I don't know. I've, you've, I've heard it a lot. Maybe you have, Jerome. Yeah. About about floods from glacial lake. Columbia. Well, they make some of the biggest bars down the Columbia. Well, that's that's the, but <laughs> but but I, I there are other, there story. are uh, there are Canadian sources of water. You don't have to appeal to Lake Columbia. Brian, two years. Holy what are you? God, <laughs> God I love it. I'm take this right yeah, now. it's a very nationalistic kind of. <laughs> Canadian water. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the the tough part for me here is that in any one outcrop here, we only see three or four floods. Yeah. And so it's all about the correlations of yes. piecing together this composite stratigraphy. Yes. Yeah. And it's not possible to do those correlations on a field trip. They're really detailed and they're hard to find. Yeah, here you can see that there's a, a sequence of floods and varves, but four or three yeah. yeah and then we'll go to the next one and we'll see another sequence that won't look the same as this yeah. that may or may not be equivalent to this yeah. and there's so much erosion going on it's all these floating little packages right? but that was for brian that was the key moment is that he could he could find specific features in varved intervals that he could correlate throughout the entire glacial lake columbia basin and tie everything together There's so much. There's so much you could do here, Jerome. Get a, get a, work on a permit from the tribe and come back. And, Definitely, and man. You've got. You've got a. Oh yeah, it's it's nonstop. Can yeah. store. Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> that, that sand over there. Holy oh. Have you seen, have you seen that out here? Which the sand of the. 
don't know what it, I mean, it's, I think it's this. I can't pick a contact by color now, unless I unless you do it here, huh? I think there are more than these two outcrops, but these two ought to do. Joel likes the upstream one, so we'll save the best for last. Maybe it's it's down here that the rhythmic alternation between between varved and something else. Uh, let's see where would be the next. Unless this is part part and parcel of a varve, but that looks different. And then the next one up the tan guys, and you can see the pattern over there too. Yeah. Oh, these are probably some of the thickest varves we've seen. Like the clay, the winter clay, or the clay unit, unless it's full of small, yeah, there's some wisps of sand through each one. Right there. <laughs> Those are turtles here. This thing here. This is a flood bed. This is a flood bed? A yeah, bed? yeah. And these are the varves. Yes. There. Yeah, those are definitely the varves. Right. So with these, what are these And things? this, and this is the, the clay cap to this so flood, flood bed. bed. Mm -hmm. And then this is the next set of varves. They're pretty well color coded. These have almost a purplish cast. You get into trouble with thick silt like this and you wonder which to assign it to. Okay, so this would be, this would be the, the top of the underlying flood bed, maybe here or there so we it's hard to know how to count these guys let's see the silt is peeling what's this the particle size going yeah it's a little coarser where you get the little so it's it goes it's here right you can see it here yeah it's fine course course fine yeah course yeah, fine. yeah 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 so if you make a generous count counting all the coarse ones you get one two three four this is thick, five, six, seven, eight, bleh, nine, ten. Now you, get you know, you get probably less than a decade. decade. Wow. In some ways, this, here again, this, this face, this face captures that, that difference really well. That one up there. Yeah. You can, and, and there again, it, with the varves, you, those are, some of those varves look pretty regular. And you yeah. just can't get more than a decade out of them. Yeah. So let's let's go up to the next outcrop because it's it's clean. It's uh, it gives you more vertical face. That's 
in the right state of dryness to So Joel, can the left bank be a, a, a Holocene debris flow fan deposit? The front of this is just so dissected. Yeah. Already. But I don't know. I think it's part of the bar. Not sure. Ten, so the, everything's moving, but it's basically clustering, and you don't have a subsequent infill like you'd have, say, on a river bar where you have the fines kind of trapping into the big. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like. So you have very rapid deposition. Yeah. Yeah. And, but at the same time, bypassing all the fines, and yeah. then after that, it's done. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, I think we gradually infill with silt and other debris that we'd have. So. So how does that work with the winnow? The evidence for winnowing at the top of the hatchery. A road cut because there you have the winnowing so like a lag a, yeah a that's right shoulders. right yeah and, and they're there there's some of them are smaller too yeah. but it's it's some places it's almost a cobble but it's a cobble gravel but it's wide open so that works so how, how does that is that winnowing mechanism similar to what you just described or different i, th I guess it would depend on whether the upper part of that sur so if the surface is the upper portion of an open work bed yeah right yeah it would look open work and winnowed yeah but it's winnowed during the flood you know during the emplacement of the bed think of it that way versus a lag where the water the surface is swept by something yes that yes can't mobilize the biggest material but is it's stripping it, away all the fines yeah i think in the end you might end up with something that looks similar mm -hmm. um but i guess in the the road that goes up to that surface above the hatchery yeah there are intervals in there that are fairly open work. Right. When you go through the up. Right. But at the same time, there are some that are more kind of debris flow like or diamictic like. Right, right. And then the the cap is probably the most open work of yeah. the bunch. There's a little, yeah. In a way, that might be telling too, because if it's just down here and that's not loaded with giant boulders, that's a clue probably that they're not moving that much. That you're just sort of excavating and exposing them, but they're not, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think where the debris flow is moving cobbles and small boulders, but it's not moving meter-sized boulders. I mean, if you look at this, now we're, now we're beyond. Right here is where the bar ends. But of course, this is Heartline here. So you're leaving behind the big boys. Yeah. Yeah. Well rounded. Mm hmm I don't know if that's a good brick will do it now. I don't think it's that well. Mm hmm Yeah. Because it's not like you have a you don't have a constant stream coming down this draw that could be moving gravel around. Oh, that's right. Really, everything's rounded. Yeah. So it's rounded from two miles to the west. I it's can't believe all reworked flood gravel yeah absolutely yeah, that, yeah. But, but also the big big boulders the meter scale boulders boulders are not rounded in the same way that they're more angular they're more angular yeah yeah, yeah. yeah they're they're chunks of columns that yeah. have been beveled yeah but they have not been converted into spheres yet yeah
Yeah, you're on the high ground now. Yeah. On the apex of the fan. Man, yeah. Yeah. So let's see, where does it, where does it end? And this, the flats out here are sandy yeah. outwash. Oh, so we're in, we're in the outwash portion. Well, beyond that, like beyond beyond that yeah. it's not flood gravel. It's but here, I think we're still on the fan, like on the debris flow. Fan. We're on the debris flow fan, and there's gonna. <laughs> A what? Mhm. Mm yeah, that's the debris flow running out of energy, and now it's dropping its silt out here. If you look at the. If you look at the before after Landsat imagery yeah. for the flood, you can see the extent of the deposition out here. Yeah. It kind of has this, it, it f made a, it freshened the surface with mm -hmm. kind of a tan color. Right. It was visible from space. Yeah. Well, it's important, Joel, what you're, to report on the modification of this landform. And it's a very late one, right? Because you also have the benching. Yeah. And. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know whether this has been previously described just as a, a single undisturbed landform, but you've got a more complicated story than that. With the benches. Yeah, the benches and the, and the, and the incision and. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to find the edge of this. This this is not like the hatchery in the you you lack a boulder lag sitting out on the low ground so it's harder to make the argument that you've winnowed out you you've you had a wall-to-wall -wall fill right. here and then you've yeah with all the big class that are up there you'd you think they would be just armored yeah, yeah. yeah. Why did we have all the fines come down Gangkuli and apparently very little fines come down this way? The fines? What do you mean by the fines? The place <laughs> actually location with all oh, the fine stuff as the matrix, the bulking up idea, the milkshake stuff. So there's no hint of that here. It doesn't appear. There's some. Even at the base. Oh, there's some. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's further. Maybe that's what's in the. In the expansion bar, the fan bar at the mouth, maybe that's some of the signs are there. Yeah, but in Grand Coulee, you got sources. You had, yeah. you had a lake held behind the Freda fan. You had a lake yeah. upstream, and they're they're accumulating silt every time between floods, and it may have been a, a very large quantity of silt that was. But doesn't that speak to then the infrequency of the usage of Grand Coulee? That you them out those lake fills. Sure dump them at Afreda, but that's basically yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. There's not a gazillion blood going through. Well, every time it happens. Well, it's it's hard to imagine from Sam Poyle that, that those floods didn't exit by way of Grand Coulee. So they must have gone through there, and there must have been a lake up near Steamboat Rock. Yeah. And... And you can see how sparsely preserved some of those lacustrine units are in the sandy outcrop that has them. Yeah. And then everywhere else where you go, it's late, it's post-flood barbs sitting directly on gravel, on but, boulder gravel. But as you said, those late ones, they're not involving necessarily like tremendous volumes of water. No, they they're aren't. Small no, they aren't. And they, but even they are are removing large parts of the varves they get sure. they get injected and and carried away so earlier floods are just 
Well, those virus would never survive earlier flood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They completely wiped out. Right. So they go to they go to be afraid of fan. Yeah. But I, it's 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 the next question is yeah. that there's a silt there there's a a big source in in addition to the, the main body of Lake Columbia itself you have the the arm of Lake Columbia and Upper Grand Coulee and then you have whatever lake was held behind the right. the the a grading fan so okay yeah yeah i think that's it's an unfair advantage that a freighter fan has in terms of a uh, fine source yeah but wait there are they're upstream of Lower Coulee of Lower Grand Coulee so. No, yeah. they're upstream of the afraid of fan. fan. Upstream of the afraid of fan. Oh, and they come they in from the side, the afraid of fan. from the east. Yeah. yeah, from the east. Yeah, the list, the list source is harder, maybe harder to replenish than the lake glacial lake source. The glacial lakes oh, just yeah. are catching everything. So, yeah. well, all right. all right, we traced the debris flow to its bitter end. It just turns into silt and then it, it's done. Oh, we didn't see the source. Yeah. So at least two of us are satisfied that big boulders weren't weren't let down in the way that they are at the trout hatchery here. And that therefore the grit, this big bar wasn't, this, it, it would be hard to make this big bar into a complete valley fill because, and then rinse everything away because he would have let down the big, the kinds of big boulders that you see up there. Out in the middle of the valley. Yeah, yeah. A giant lag of watermelons, basically. Yeah. In the Unless you buried it in sand. Yeah, in fair enough. Yeah. Uh, yep. You winnowed it, it's under the sand. Yeah. Yeah, good point, that. Joel. Can't let anything get past Joel. There's always another. How much sand is there? How much, yeah, how, how deep is the fill here? A lot. It is? Yeah. Okay. And how do you know? Uh, Larry Hansen did seismic. Oh, he did, okay. Reflection lines yeah. here. And there's there's water wells. There's a whole groundwater report for how water yeah. moves through upper, Grand, upper Moses Cooley. And it goes through sand, and then the sand thins to nothing in sagebrush. Flat Are the space in that fill? Who knows? Well, you'd know if you're drilling. Unless well, you missed it. Larry, that's but Larry has entire cross sections here mm -hmm. showing depth to bedrock and yeah. stuff, right? I mean, it's really nice work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's and there's some more. Yeah. 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 What do you think? Two hundred feet of fill here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's hundreds of feet. Yeah. <laughs> oh. All right. <laughs> All right, the boulders are under there then. And this was a valley fill. <laughs> and from which direction? Perturbations. <laughs> oh, come on, Nick. Come up with plain English that that's dramatic. You call you call you call this a perturbation? I would as well. This poor lake <laughs> is that stuff. Okay. That's the yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then and then it's and then it, and then it's perturbed <laughs> <laughs> by this, right?